ones. Does everybody have a seat who wants one right now? Okay, because we do have a couple more. We may squeeze in. I thought this is a very popular event. We appreciate her being here. Um, and the other thing is to point out again, it's a very full room and any noise will be heard by your neighbors. So let's silence those cell phones if you don't mind. Um, I'm now going to hand the microphone to Library Trustee Betty Kelly Sargent who will introduce our panel and proceed with the evening. Thank you. I was told I get to sit down. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, goody. Okay. I'm Betty Sargent and I am very happy <laughs> Welcome you to the second evening in the New York Society Libraries Meet the Publishing Pros. The idea behind this series is simple. One of the great things about this extraordinary library, which was founded in 1754, in case any of you didn't know that, is that it is located right smack in the middle of New York City, which is also the home to the book publishing industry in the U.S. So, why not create some synergy, we thought, between these two groups, those who create the books that we all love to read and those of us who help circulate them. We would like to know more about the publishing business and we would like the publishers to know more about us. One of the things the library is dedicated to is supporting our writer members, of which there are many, in fact, included in our membership is access to the fifth floor writer's room, which is filled to the brim every day with hard-working authors, many of whom have been published by major publishers. And we're lucky to have some very talented writers with us tonight. I'm sure there are more, but these are the ones I know about. John Searles, who is the author of Strange But True. Elizabeth Kelly, author of Fog Farm, and John Emmerling, author of Woofy Leaks. Woofy Leaks, I never pronounce it right. So tonight we're focusing on the role of the agent in book publishing, and we're honored to have with us three of the top agents in New York City, Brenda Bowen, John Silversack, and Emma Sweeney. I'm going to tell you about it really briefly, and then we're going to get into the good stuff. Brenda Bowman represents books for young readers and adults at Greenberger Associates. She's the author of Enchanted August, and under the name of Margaret McNamara, she is the award-winning author of more than 40 books for children. Before becoming a literary agent in 2009, she was editorial director of Henry Holt Books for Young Readers. Before that, she worked at Scholastic, then, I mean, even before that, Hyperion and Simon and & Schuster. Very experienced, as you can see. John Silversack, now at the Bent Agency, is a publishing professional with deep experience as an editor and a publisher. He spent 17 years as the Executive Vice President of Trident Media Group, and before that, he was an editor at HarperCollins, Warner Books, and Penguin Putnam. He founded six imprints. <clears throat> John has represented many New York Times bestsellers, and he himself is an author. And on my left, Emma Sweeney started her agency in 2006. Before that, she'd been an agent at Harold Ober and Curtis Brown, and was rights director at Grove Press. She has represented eight New York Times bestsellers, including Water for Elephants. And her authors have won the Booker Prize the, and the American Book Award and been shortlisted for the Orange Prize and the National Book Award. She is also the author of two books, including As Always, comma, Jack, which is one of my favorite books of all time. So this evening, each agent is going to speak for about five minutes on who they are, how they operate, and what kind of books they're looking for. And then we're going to open up to questions from the audience. And my plan is to point to people when they raise their hands and then repeat their question just to make sure everybody um, can hear 
And if you would like to direct it to one particular agent, feel free to do that. Okay? So let's let's start with Brenda. Oh. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I'm a children's book person, and so children's book people always bring <laughs> pictures. <laughs> so, well, and they bring little um, toys. Aww. So I brought both pictures and toys. So um, children's <coughs> books, uh, why did I get into that? Because I worked at uh, Basic Books, which was part of Harper uh, and Row, now Harper Collins, for a year, and I just couldn't read any of the books. They were social science books. All the editors were PhDs in their field, and I didn't have any connection to them. But then there was a sign on the job board, which was literally a bulletin board. All of you know what a bulletin board is. Uh, in, in the bathroom at Harper and Row, and it said "Reader Wanted Children's Books," and I thought, "Well, that's what I should do." I don't know why to this day I thought that. Although I was an art history and English major, so visuals were always interesting to me. Uh, so I, as um, as you heard earlier, I got into publishing. I was in publishing for about 25 years. Uh, and I ran various departments, uh, children's book departments. I know a lot of you are not running children's books, so I won't well. Uh, are there any artists here tonight? A couple artists groups. Um, we have, I wanted to show you. There it's the bottom book. Um, I just thought I'd plug the, um, the library itself. So this is by Chris Roshka. Chris is um, a denizen of this library. Probably a lot of people have seen him here. Uh, it, uh, it is a book about uh, St. Paul. And um, it's, uh, it's his own sort of free translations of St. Paul. This is the kind of book I love to represent because it takes a subject that could be so uh, pedestrian, uh, the life of St. Paul, and turns it into something highly individual. He wrote the pictures and the word, well, he didn't write the words, he, he interpreted the words. And I believe he did a lot of his research right here. Um, so I represent picture books written and illustrated by um, author artists. I also represent picture books that are just written by authors. So you might be an author of a picture book. This is a book called Echo Echo. It's a book of poetry that can be read <coughs> from top first line to last line or from last line to first line, and hence its name. And it's interpretations of Greek myths. We're heavily into Greeks today in, uh, in poetic form. And it's a fascinating book. It was not written here, but uh, just shows you the breadth of the kind of picture books that are coming out these days. Uh, I also represent um, fiction. Uh, this is a book called Better Nate Than Ever. It's by Tim, Tim Federley. It's about a, a boy who um, leaves Ohio, no, leaves uh, Pittsburgh to go to New York and seek bright lights in big city. And then I represent um, contemporary middle grade and, and young adult and all sorts of things in between. And the occasional adult book. So this is a humor book that I have, which uh, was miraculously sold about 500,000 copies. Uh, and um, uh, one of the books that I love to talk about is um, The Wonderful Things You Will Be, which was an idea, a notion in an artist's head uh, to write about uh, what a baby could become. And has, this has now sold a million copies just a couple months ago to reach that mark. And there's various merchandise. So, <laughs> so that's what it, so what an agent does, which many of you know, is um, they they an agent represents the interests and the and the, the creative career of uh, the authors and in my case artists who um, want to work with that agent. And each author has a different personality, a different style, and so seeks an agent who will represent best that personality and that and that style. Uh, we do everything from negotiated contract, which I always feel is, uh, uh, people think, oh, that's the big thing that an agent does. I feel that's about 20%, if that, of what an agent does. It's important that you get um, uh, paid well, compensated well, uh, paid good royalties for your work. But the agent's job goes on way beyond um, negotiating the contract. The agent is there to hear when the cover doesn't look nice or when uh, 
author is nervous about a speaking event or when an author doesn't know how to talk to her editor, uh, the, the agent is always there. And, and many of you probably know that an agent is paid a percentage of your revenues, and we can get into all that later, um, to be on call all the time. So it's not like a, a lawyer, we're not lawyers, well, some of us are lawyers, I'm not, uh, but lawyers that you pay by the hour, an agent is always, should always be there for you. Whether it's an editorial question, or I want to read this sentence to you, or mm -hmm. I don't know what to do with my career, I hate everything I've ever worked on, what can I do <laughs> you? You know, we're, we're there for everything, and for the celebrations, too, for the great sharing in success. Um, so, for people who are interested in writing for books, uh, books for children, writing, illustrating anywhere from age two to age about 16, um, that's what I do, and I would be delighted to answer your questions. And that's my five minutes, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now, John Solisette. <clears throat> it's hard to follow that. Uh, yeah, I, I wish I would brought some visuals. But, uh, <laughs> I did bring some quiz notes, so uh, <laughs> forgive me for that. I, I was once uh, doing what Betty's doing here and introducing Isaac Asimov and her and he said, you know, you're really bad at that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, you know, keep notes handy next time. Uh, uh, but, you know, I, I thought I'd, I'd just start by, by thanking Betty and, and, and the Society Library here. This is really special. This is a really special place. Speak uh, into I, the mic. We can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Is that yeah, I, do. Uh, I was saying that this is a really special place. Uh, I, I used to be a member here. I wrote a book upstairs, uh, uh, a Buck Rogers novel, if you're, if you're curious. Uh, I don't recommend it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's maybe worth a while. Um, so I got my start, uh, uh, as Betty said, and so many agents. I did uh, working on the other side of the fence. I was I was a publisher, uh, and I I began my career in what is now really a lost world, a forgotten world maybe of, uh, of mass market publishing. Uh, um, mass market books we still see them, but we don't see them uh, uh, you know in the in the in the throngs that we used to, um, um, uh, and. Since our, our topic tonight is is trends in publishing, uh, you know my my sense of the, the kinds of trends that, that most affect uh, working writers uh, have have less to do with whether or not vampires are in this year or whether it's uh, Walking Dead or uh, or uh, um, uh, Young Woman in Peril or what have you. Uh, but the trends that I, I really see as as deeply affecting. Uh, working writers are, are industry trends. Uh, uh, the way uh, our, our book system has, has morphed and changed uh, over the, you know, gosh, uh, I guess it's uh, 40 years that I've been involved and, uh, you know, and long before that. Uh, but we've gone through enormous, enormous changes. My career sort of mirrored a lot of those changes. So if I'll just You'll bear with me a moment. I'll just sort of take you through through some of that. Uh, um, as I said, I started out uh, in mass market publishing uh, briefly at, at, at Putnam, but then moved to Berkeley immediately and uh, uh, began working on uh, uh, producing a line of books. Uh, I was 23 years old. I was responsible for coming up with uh, six titles a month, uh, and. Uh, and it was a marvelous thing because that was a world um, captured, uh, and I'll make a, a book recommendation. Al Silverman wrote a wonderful book called uh, uh, The Time of Their Lives uh, uh, that speaks about, uh, about this, this era. But um, uh, uh, mass market paperbacks, which really fueled this industry for a long time, I think 90% of uh, all the money in the industry came out of mass market and, and just kept the whole thing uh, revolving. Um, uh, depended on something called force distribution. Um, and, uh, you know, I had a, uh, an A slot, a B slot, a C slot, and, you know, so on. And I knew reliably my A 
a slot, 600 to 700,000 copies. Uh, and I'll have a 55% sell through. Uh, B slot, you know, slightly less than that. Way down into the, the my bottom echelons, you know, 200,000 copies out the door for the kinds of books that I was doing. Uh, and I mention this because there are editorial consequences uh, to, to, you know, uh, a shift from, from, from that world. Uh, uh, those books, most of my life has been spent in genre publishing, uh, and now, uh, I'll come to this later, but now my list is, is a mixture of, of nonfiction and fiction. But, you know, genre publishing is where I began. And genre publishing, um, you know, if you remember your $1.95 paperbacks, you know, you used to have the, uh, uh, you know, the genre on the spine. It might, it might have said uh, mystery, it might have said gothic, uh, 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 science fiction, or fantasy, or what have you. Uh, 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 this was a time when uh, you could publish into these genres. As I say, it really, in large measure, you know, I, it was up to me to just put a book in there. I could put a, a brand new working author, somebody who, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, never, never published a story before. And, you know, I could, you know, get 300,000 new readers for that author, uh, you know, every month. Um, and, you know, at the top of my list, I was publishing, you know, what were, in, I was doing auto science fiction at that point in time. Uh, uh, household names, Bill Jose Farmer, Frank Herbert, uh, 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 Robert Heinlein, Isaac Asimov. Uh, but down, you know, in, the, in the midst of this list, I could experiment and I could uh, uh, publish uh, books and know that I was going to build readers for them uh, by you know, people like Ursula Le Guin or uh, James Tiptree or Joanna Ross or Samuel Delaney or uh, Philip K. Dick. Uh, you know, and these were authors who, who you know, at the time were, were, were kind of struggling. Uh, but we had a system in place where the gatekeepers, if you will, people like, like, like all of us, uh, uh, were able to get these voices heard. And it was, it was a really tremendously exciting thing. Um, um, but it was something that didn't last. Uh, uh, in the you know the seventies, eighties, and nineties, we, we saw you know, the growth of the bookstore chains, uh, and uh, um, that didn't kill off mass market books, uh, but it, it did change the dynamic a bit. And those chains, if you remember the superstores of yesteryear, there aren't too many around, and the ones that are still around are full of a lot of things other than books. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, you have to fill up those shelves, almost like wallpaper, you know, and, you know, uh, a big Borders or, or, or Barnes & Noble, uh, uh, this is after the day of Brentano's and what have you, uh, you would be, you know, looking to, uh, you know, stock those shelves, and, you know, with hundreds of thousands of titles in there, those titles wouldn't churn as fast as those wire racks of mass markets in your, your supermarket. Uh, so, you know, what is the, the merchandising thing that one does when one is, is stocking a store where the product doesn't turn so fast? You sell more expensive product. And we began to see, you know, the advent of trade paperbacks and, and, and hardcovers, which of course have always been uh, with us, but, you know, suddenly hardcover, you know, Hardcovers are selling in, in much bigger volume than they had before. Uh, you know, not for most of us, not for you know, uh, uh, writers like myself, but uh, you know, the big bestsellers suddenly were selling in, in, in more volume. Um, so what did that mean for you as, as, as writers? But there was a big shift there uh, because suddenly uh, you're selling a, a kind of book um, that has you know, slower turnover. It's, it's got to sit in that store for a while before you pick it up. And uh, it's not really forced on you. It's not simply being pushed out. It requires marketing. Uh, and uh, 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 that dreaded word today, you know, I hear so often from, from editors, uh, you know, what's, what's the platform? Uh, they'll, they'll ask me. Uh, it used to be they just asked me that about 
nonfiction, but now increasingly I hear that on the fiction front. Um, um, these were, you know, this was a fundamental change in not only the way books are published or distributed, but the kinds of books then that could be successful because these are the books which, you know, these, these accounts can take in and, and, and get in front of you. And as an agent uh, today, this is part of what I'm looking at uh, as a shift in the trends of publishing. What I, I know when I see uh, queries uh, across my desk, and I, just out of curiosity, I, I looked this up today, uh, I've had 2,437 2, queries since uh, September 1st. Uh, uh, and, you know, when I, uh, 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 I've got a very neat email that, that puts all the queries right into one, one pile, and it's, it's a task getting through them. Uh, but what I'm looking for as I'm going through that are those, those things that are going to help me help those authors break through some of these fundamental changes. Uh, so I'm uh, probably going too long. Isaac also said that you know, he could time us. You know, we'll talk. In a second, I can't. Uh, but I'll, so I'll try and be uh, swift here. But uh, uh, you know, at the same time that all this was going on, mass market publishing was collapsing. Uh, that distribution system uh, just died for really bizarrely stupid reasons. Uh, uh, if you remember the Safeway supermarkets, um, okay. So Safeway, uh, there were 700 regional wholesalers for paperbacks. Safeway uh, 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 decided, well, you know what, uh, maybe we could get a better discount if we, if we uh, uh, held a bidding war and we just got one wholesaler to service our account. And, uh, <coughs> uh, and they did that, and uh, some thought that it was rigged, but uh, uh, they uh, ended up uh, with one wholesaler. All the other wholesalers in other markets that Safeway had been in suddenly had pins pulled out from under them because the way mass market books were sold, truckers would take books and drop them off at different depots, hardware stores, uh, 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 convenience stores, whatever, on their way to the supermarket where the big money was. Uh, and uh, uh, a year later, Safeway was out of business. Large wholesalers, Anderson, Levy, uh, and, uh, and uh, one other name is, is escaping me. Uh, and Moody's, uh, uh, the people who you know look good at our portfolios, I guess, and tell us whether or not they're uh, a safe bet, decided that books weren't a very safe bet. And uh, they downgraded uh, uh, Anderson's and uh, this other firm's. Uh, Reading, and uh, suddenly those wholesalers are, are out of business. Uh, Moody's, incidentally, was also the, the firm that downgraded Borders, uh, and you know, a year later, Borders was out of business. Uh, and uh, 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 suddenly, we were left with one paperback wholesaler uh, in in the country. Uh, we went from roughly 480. Uh, titles a month being produced as mass market paperbacks in their many, 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 many millions to, uh, uh, I'm guessing about 30 titles are released uh, on a monthly basis today. Uh, and you, you see, you're, you've seen the retrenchment yourself. Uh, uh, you know, it used to be books were the most ubiquitous uh, consumer product in the world. You, know, you could buy a book in almost every kind of store. Uh, you know, supermarkets, uh, 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 as I said, hardware stores, uh, at uh, you know, kiosks on streets and what have you. Uh, you know, think of something else that you could, you know, you could find, <coughs> uh, find that easily. But books are no longer that easy to find. Uh, and the ones that are left um, uh, are ones that uh, can be found for, uh, for other reasons than, than, than before. And those reasons have to do with, again, their marketing potential, 
big established name author, um, uh, uh, platform, what have you. Uh, and so here again, this is sort of what I look at as I begin to you know, go through that, that query uh, pile. I'll cut this short now just to say that you know, uh, I made that switch at about the right time. I sort of saw the writing on the wall. Uh, I was, was forced to I was at uh, Parker Collins running a division that merged with William Morrow, and I was merged out of a job. Uh, and I, I looked at uh, uh, the future, and I said, you know, in, in a world where uh, whole categories of publishing can be pulled out from under you, whole ways of getting uh, getting books to consumers and in a way that affects the kinds of books that are, are being written. Uh, you know, when's the last time you saw a Western? When's the last time you saw a Gothic? These might not have been, you know, or men's adventure novels. These might not have been the, the chosen reading material of uh, many people in this room, but they were uh, something that millions and millions of, of, of people in this country read. Gone. Uh, because the distribution system changed, not because the readers disappeared. Uh, so I made the choice. I'm going to become an agent where I can be more flexible and uh, not depend on one sales force, one, one apparatus, one, one, one house. Uh, uh, and that was uh, in 2000. Um, uh, I went from a large agency now to a small agency. Uh, I uh, mixed up my list. Now, 50% nonfiction, 50% fiction. Heavy emphasis still on, on, on genre books. I, I do a lot of suspense, thrillers, mysteries, science fiction, uh, you know, fantasy. I'm, I'm still Frank Herbert's uh, estates agent now. Uh, 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 and on the nonfiction side, a lot of biography, history, politics. But I'm, you know, I'm looking for, again, if there's a trend that I'm ways to, for those, those projects, aside from the fact that they have to be very, very well written, uh, uh, those projects that I can tell a story about and get other people to hear that story and pick them up. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And now, Emma? Emma? Oh, I think I have my little I guess. I'm not really comfortable with it. That was really great to hear because I um, didn't know a lot of what John was saying. And thank you, Betty, for asking me to join. And Brenda, how great to see all that and um, uh, colorful and interesting. And I don't do any children. I hardly know paperback. So um, I'm not sure if I want to depress you all with facts about <laughs> nobody buys books anymore. No, I'm kidding. But that's um, the fact of life. You know, we. I did see. In, um, <coughs> our trade magazine earlier this week, a survey, I think it was by the Authors Guild of the average salary of a writer today. Oh, yes. Is it like 6,000 a year? Yeah. yeah. That's the average for, and that includes all self-published books, as I oh, understand it. Yes, I think, you're right. I couldn't swear to that, but I think it does. Yeah. Which means don't get too depressed. Don't get, don't, <laughs> don't, no, and then so, so to uh, write in the message, uh, and, and I want to hear, I'm, I'm going to talk very, very briefly because I'm sure everyone has lots and lots of questions, but, um, you know, there is a real silver lining, and um, in that same article it mentioned something about the um, speakers' fees and people doing speaking events, and I, um, you know, some sort of 12, I, I forget what it was, but like 22 to 30 percent of an author's income today is from events. Was it that high? I don't it was like that. it was high enough that well, I have two people from my office. In the back, so they, they can correct me if I'm wrong. Remember? Yeah, but Mark, but someone had sent it to me saying like, oh, I'm glad we book authors' events now because that's like a little pocket of income, you know, doing author events. So who knew 20 years ago? Just like who knew we wouldn't have all the paperbacks were. But the other thing I want to mention as a sort of silver lining and why it's okay that there have been all these changes is that you know there's a lot going on in TV film and podcasts and digital rights and audio and 
you know, people buy audiobooks like crazy today. Mm -hmm. The deals are better than ever. The, um, you know, I never thought I'd be saying, oh, I love doing podcasts. Like, the podcast business is really interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, there are all kinds of ways. And, and uh, at the end of the day, um, content is king. You know, and writers are the providers of the content. So what more could you ask for? So, um, and I think we should hear, I mean, unless you want me to say more about what I'm looking for. Question. No, I, I okay. mean, that's just terrific. Okay. Thank you, all three of you, that was wonderful. And John, I had known, I started out in the paperback business too, working for Dell Publishing, when it was a really hot <coughs> thing. And, and I've seen all these same changes that you described, and it's mm. really dramatic mm -hmm. and kind of hard to grasp. But so thank you for bringing that to all of us. So now that you see what, what great talented people we have here, um, I'd like to open this to questions from, from the audience. That's you. Does anybody have a question? Yes. Sir. A uh, question for John. You uh, mentioned, I think, if I heard it right, since December 1st, you've had 2,000 and some inquiries? No, September 1st. <laughs> September. 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 Oh, okay. Can we project that out and say that in an average year you might get close to ten thousand queries? I, you know, I don't know. Uh, uh, just, a, just ballpark. Uh, I would guess yes. It probably so. So, um, a question every author here without representation would want to know is how many new authors did you take on? In this year, <laughs> new authors this year. Uh, well, not this year. It's only ten days old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 I think uh, six or seven. Right. Ah. My goodness. New but, authors. New authors. Yes. Right. But we're uh, old. Published. We're old people. You know, you have to. If you're an aspiring writer, there are a lot of young, hungry, good agents out there who need good talent and good voices. And we, I think all three of us have pretty established client lists. And we're always looking for someone great. Um, but don't <coughs> go to the, you know, to us. You know, please, we, we're, our doors are open, but don't, don't only go to us. Go to people who are young and hungry and need books and need good writers. I think that's a very good point. And I've always been amazed at how, at why, it seems difficult for so many writers to find an agent, because agents need books. I mean, that's what they do. And there are some brilliant, amazing agents around. And so to me, there's always been sort of a, a, a mysterious problem there. You know, you should be able to get an agent because, because they need you if you're a writer. So just remember that. <laughs> Um, yes, yes ma'am. Uh, I'd like each of the agents to tell us what are you looking for when you go through and discard queries. Okay, I, I said I would repeat the question, so if anybody didn't hear that, um, the question is what are each of our three agents here tonight looking for when they go through these query piles? I mean, you know, just a sort of succinct, more or less, what are you looking for? So Emma, would you? Sure. Um, so I think, so I'm looking for someone who's a professional, they know how to write a letter that uh, is going to get your attention, so they're going to, you know, start off uh, telling you, you start off with, you know, the strongest suit, the best information they can give you. If they're a published author, they're going to put that up front, they're going to, you know, grab you with their brief synopsis, um, the brief, you know, one sentence description of their book. They're going to use comps the way we use comps because we know how important it is to say, you know, who are the readers for this book? Oh, they're the readers who loved The Kite Runner. You know, it's like you know your book well enough to give it that um, specificity. And um, so that's what I'm looking for. Okay, thank you. John. What is a comp? <coughs> Excuse me, what? What is a comp? comp. Comparison title? Well, what is this book? What is your book like? A book that everybody knows, you know, this is just like Gone with the Wind, that sort of thing. Um, I hope it works. It's not very often expressed as Gone with the Wind meets uh, uh, right. uh, uh, Zombie Apocalypse. 
John, John, would you uh, speak to that question? Well, I, I, I couldn't have said it better. I mean, it, the thing I look for first and foremost is uh, a well-written letter, uh, uh, because if, if the letter isn't well-written, and the, uh, the manuscript is certainly not going to be. Uh, uh, and you know, I really do encourage you. I hate to say it, but get get that hook right up front, uh, right at the top, because you know if you have a, a mailbox full of I don't know 20, 30, what of these in a day, and you're trying to find time to flip through them, you're, you you may lose interest in a few in a, you know in a few sentences. Uh, it takes time just to open these queries, and uh, uh, that's. This is tough. This is a tough uh, market. Uh, uh, and yet, every agent I know, and every publisher too, is, we're in the business because we love books and we're always looking for the next great thing. We're looking for something that we're going to fall in love with. But we don't have time to, to or at least, you know, I think few people have time to, to dwell on, on, well, maybe this is, a, you know, maybe there's something here. Uh, so you know, get it up, get it right up front. Uh, uh, those selling points that, that Emma mentioned, uh, uh, and uh, and we're looking. You know, we want we want to love the next letter. We want to love the next manuscript. That's great, right? Um It's very it's very subjective business. So uh, I look to find a title that intrigues me, and then I open that query. I tend to open those queries first. Uh, then in the query letter, I, I like to think, would I like to have a conversation with this person? Would I like to go out and have a glass of wine with this person? That is really what I think, because I do a lot of fiction, and, 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 and I can't always judge the query letter on the way it's written, because I also work with a lot of artists, and they're not, a lot of them are not so happily verbal. They much <laughs> rather express themselves in their art. So that's a criterion that's different for me than it is for other people. I don't like to see typos in a letter at all, at all. Uh, I don't like to see bad grammar. But mostly I want to see, do, would I like to work on this? Um, and that's, I think, uh, the privilege of a fiction, um, someone who uh, looks at fiction in particular. Um, yeah, we all have query probably inboxes or separate folders. Mine has a bounce back that says, if I haven't responded to you within six weeks, it might be six weeks or eight weeks, it means I've missed the boat on your book. So I don't want people to be waiting forever and ever uh, to hear back from me. Um, but if I'm not able to get back to it in eight weeks in any form, that means I probably am not, uh, it means I'm, I'm letting it go. And you should find a different person who responds more quickly and more enthusiastically. That's kind. That's what I'm <laughs> Uh, yes, ma'am. Is it okay if in a letter such as that, if we were to query a letter not only to the hook in, but to add some edited names that you know or that you've worked with before that may be interested in the book that you have So I believe the question. Crossing boundaries. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it crossing boundaries or is it okay to, to do a query letter to suggest? An editor or two that you might know or you work with who might like to see this. Uh, yeah, I, I think the question is if when you write a query letter to an agent, if you happen to have any contacts with editors, mm -hmm. is it okay to mention that? that? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and who, who would you like to answer that? Well, Brenda? I say yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. John? I was waiting for. Uh, oh. I feel like this is like dancing with the stars. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, I say yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I tend not to. I, I, I uh, uh, I've been disappointed on that part often enough that it, it, I should just sort of discount that. Uh, um, uh, and it's probably unfair, but uh, you know, so often it's, it's turned out not to be the case. So. <coughs> uh, yes. Hi, um, I've been told that in order to uh, get an agent, it's very helpful to not publish in magazines. Um, if that's true, I wonder if <coughs> online magazines count. But my most specific question is: assume that one were to get a story published in a reputable magazine. Um, if that story comes out 
of the book is that will that deter a publisher if the if one part of the book, a small part, has already been published in the Okay. So the question oh there, I think it wasn't turned on. <laughs> the question is if you have had one part of your novel or your book, whatever it is, published in a magazine, is that a deterrent when approaching an agent? Is that correct? If it's part of, yeah, if it's part of the book. Yeah, does that, is that a, a plus or a minus, I guess, is the question. Um, big plus, oh. big, yeah, definitely. And I don't know, if it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's great, it shows you've been published and it's uh, <coughs> from the book and it's something that people probably enjoyed and now you're gonna follow it up with a novel, it's definitely good. Yeah, I, I'd say a huge plus too. Uh, now that would be probably reason enough for me to think seriously about asking for the full name. Do you agree, Brenda? I do, but it's not really my thing. Uh, oh, know. okay. There are not that many children's magazines, so, so it's, it's kind of moved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not as much as <laughs> opportunity. Right. Um, yes, ma'am. What else uh, do you like to see in this query letter? Do you like uh, a breakdown of the chapters? How much do you want to know about the book? So the question is, it, um, in a query letter, how much does an agent want to know about the book? Like a detailed outline, an overview? Um, does the letter, is it smart to keep the letter on one page? I've always thought that was kind of a cool idea. So that was the question, how, how much do you want to know about the book? Brenda? Um, I, I like to see my name spelled properly at the beginning. <laughs> and then I like to see, um, I'm writing to you to tell you about my novel. As time goes by, uh, a book of, that will appeal to uh, readers of this and that uh, about one girl's quest to find her true parents, who are ghosts. Uh, and then a paragraph on your book. When Julie woke up one morning, and to the, just to the sort of act one, just give us a little bit, like what you would read on the back cover or the flap of the book. Then about you, you know, I am, uh, I've written in several magazines, in fact, part of this has appeared in the magazine before, and uh, I know three editors who I've met at conferences and they've said they want to look at my book, or I am, um, I've never written before, this is my first novel, period. Uh, so, Little little synopsis, like a little tagline up front, paragraph on what it is, comparative titles, your credentials, exit. That's it. Are we talking about emails? Yes, we are talking about emails. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, is that is your question answered? Yes. Okay. Uh, the, the man in the back with the gray sleeve? <laughs> I think it's a man, maybe it's a woman, sorry. You, didn't you just have your hand up? Yes ma'am, sorry, yes. I was looking yeah. for a man with a gray sleeve. There are a lot of people in the room, I just didn't want to go with somebody else was supposed to. Um, so in terms of, platform was briefly mentioned earlier, so in terms of book marketability, the actual writing and platform, what does the breakdown wind up looking like in terms of sellability? In other words, how important is platform compared to the book itself? Is that the idea? Platform and marketing. Platform and marketing, marketing compared, compared to yes, the, 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 the quality of what you're writing. And I, I guess it seems to me that the question is, if you've written something that's really wonderful and you don't have a big platform, is that okay? Is that? No, I have a no. huge platform. <laughs> I'm, I'm asking ratio-wise out of the three, because you can't sell a book with just one, okay. and you can't sell a book with just two. <clears throat> so, so you're asking which is the most important? Right. So like if you know, like like if you're breaking down what makes a book sell, yeah, you can write yeah. in order of importance. That's fine. Okay. Yes. So what do you think, John? Well, I guess this is throwing things on the one who brought up that dreadful word. Uh, uh, Look, it, it mostly, first of all, are we talking about the query or are we talking about the book? Uh, there's, a big, there's a big distinction there. But uh, uh, the most important thing is that the, the book be wonderful. And it's, it, it, there's, there's, in this market today, and maybe, maybe it's always been us, uh, 
there's, there's no point in any of us spending time on, 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 on books that we don't think are wonderful uh, uh, in some way. Uh, but it certainly helps, as I say, if that wonderful book uh, has, if, uh, if there's a, an easily a recognizable way to get that other people to understand that the book is wonderful, and that's the platform. Uh, uh, and that might, might be simply that you've been doing a lot of writing for magazines, and your name is out there, and there's a buzz about you, and people are really waiting to see what you will do in long form. Uh, it might be uh, uh, that you're well known in some other sphere, and uh, uh, you bring that uh, back to the table. You, you, you've been a very successful uh, defense attorney, for instance, and, and you're writing a, a legal thriller or a, a suspense novel of some sort. Uh, uh, as I say, I've, I've a certain amount of science fiction, and uh, uh, it's, it's surprising how many of uh, uh, the authors that I've, I'm successful with are uh, uh, very eminent scientists uh, who also write very well, and uh, uh, they have you know, uh, they have the ability to you know, convince people that uh, uh, that their uh, the, the science and the futurism of their their work. Is, is worth paying attention to. Uh, and then it could develop this other things that I'm a little uh, more uncertain about, like uh, how many Twitter followers you have, or Instagram followers, or Facebook followers. Uh, uh, you know, I feel that a lot of other people have a better handle on, on how useful that is than, than, than I do. Uh, uh, certainly publishers like to hear that you have a lot of that. Uh, it's never been very clear to me whether that translates directly into book sales or not. Do you agree? I do. Yes. Okay. I, I think that uh, in my world, especially in young adult publishing, uh, which is teen, uh, if you have a sizable <coughs> Twitter community following you, it does help with your sales, and that is your platform. So people are wondering what a platform is. It's it's your uh, visibility beyond um, sort of your, your desk and your room. It's how visible are you? And so, uh, yeah, I would say Instagram, well, uh, a lot of books come from Instagram. A lot of books come from Twitter. So um, if you have a big following and, uh, and 3,000 people followed this one thread that you were writing on, on Twitter, then maybe that will translate into a book. Good, great, thank you. Um, the, yes, the person with the white sleeve. John, <laughs> 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 uh, you mentioned it has to be a wonderful book. I wonder if any of you want to comment on the fact that some of the books that are on the bestseller list are really not wonderful books. <laughs> <laughs> it so the question is, why are some of the books on the bestseller list uh, not, quote, wonderful books. And that was directed to John. Well, that's a very uh, difficult question to answer. Uh, 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 you know, I, I make it, uh, Make a project of, of trying to stay familiar with the bestseller list, and I, you know, uh, I don't read everything that hits hits uh, the list, but I try and uh, take a look at anything that seems like it's sustaining and you know, it's, it's an author who's there a lot and new to the list, and uh, looks like they, they represent uh, uh, you know a kind of enthusiastic audience. And very often, I'm reading something which uh, uh, I would rather not be spending my time with. Uh, uh, it's true. I mean, there uh, there are a lot of books there which, which you know are, are barely literate. Sometimes I feel, but you know what? This is a big country with a lot of different kinds of readers who are looking for different kinds of reading experiences, and you can you know parse these things out. And you know, uh, if you're if you keep an open mind, you can really figure out. You know, why is this popular? And, and you know, maybe it's it's you know, 
somebody who uh, just moves that plot along lickety split, uh, uh, and you know maybe doesn't have time for the nuance of characterization or what have you. Those might be things that appeal to me, but not, maybe not to my next door neighbor. Uh, I think you have to give uh, readers the benefit of the doubt. It, they're looking for different things. Just as somebody might once have been looking for a Western and you don't, don't acknowledge that you know, cowboys have much to say. Uh, 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 you know, somebody's looking for uh, you know, a pot boiler, and that's fine too. As far as I'm concerned, so long as people are reading. That's a very, very good answer. Do you, do you think you yeah, and it's so subjective. I mean, exactly, just as long as people are reading. But if we didn't believe that one person was going to like a book, we wouldn't become <coughs> such passionate advocates for it. Right. So we hear a lot of no's on the way to a yes. And so there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of disagreement about what's good or what's bad. Or exactly. what's good. And a, a lot of folks, I, I remember once, um, Years ago, I, I was in a publishing company, and I went to this. I went to the pub board with a book that my son had given me, and it was written by some girls in his yoga class. And I described this book, and they said, "No, no, I'm sorry, we can't do it." So I sent it back to them, and uh, they did a little work, and they brought sent it in again, and I thought it was pretty cool, and took it to the pub board, and they said no, and it was the Nanny Diaries. <laughs> so just so you know, you know, we all make mistakes. Editors make mistakes. I, not that that's a mistake, but they miss opportunities. Um, and sometimes you have to just take a chance on something that's unusual. At least this was in my experience as an editor, not an agent, but an editor. So don't give up. Uh, yes, sir, in the plan. Nice. Um, uh, maybe Brenda, for you particularly, or any of you, uh, I believe all agents, or most agents, have submission guidelines. I want to return to the query letter, and I think that should be followed. But it, you were outlining the, the query letter a few moments ago, and you said there's a paragraph that basically flat, co flat copy about it. Is something attached? Is five pages attached? Or? Oh, yeah. Each uh, agent that you're going to submit. So the question was, uh, in addition to the query letter, what do you attach to your query uh, or send in if you're doing it by snail mail, which many agents don't accept anymore. Uh, so each agent uh, will have his or her own guidelines. They might say, I want the first 20 pages embedded in the email. I want right. an, a Word doc with the whole book. I want a PDF with all of it. Everybody's going to be different. And agents really appreciate it if you are able to take the time to follow what they've asked for, because it makes it easier for them to, to read and respond to your query. Can I just follow up? Is it uh, knowing your book and represent the re the writer of the query letter representing that they know that I think you might be interested in this, Brenda, because I know what you've published and this is That's always flattering. You okay. know? Right. I, I see that you represent Timothy, therefore. But sometimes it feels very cut and paste. You yeah, know, okay. Like, and the other thing is, be careful. It's you know, maybe Gone with the Wind could be a good query because people haven't, you know, there's been no Gone with the Wind for a long time. But be careful of saying this is the next Harry Potter. Yeah, right, right. This is the next John Grisham. Because it's too big and too wide a, a, a comparison. Rather, you know, as, as Emma said, be as specific as you can. This is like the Kite Runner. This is like Lord or, or whatever. Yes. And one thing I would just like to add for a minute is that it's very important when you submit material to an agent that you know about that agent, that you know what kind of books that agent likes, that you look in, in, the, in the books in your genre or similar to your book and see what agents are acknowledged. That's a really good trick. You know, if you write mysteries and you look at a few mysteries and you see, oh, they're all thanking X agent. So that the agent feels that you really have chosen them for a reason, not that you're just doing this blanket submission to a ton of people. So I think that can be can be helpful. Yes. You know, just to that, that point, uh, uh, there's a uh, online uh, website, I guess you'd call it, uh, called Publishers Marketplace, uh, and uh, uh, they do a very good job of aggregating deals. Not every book that's sold makes its way in there, but, but many, many, probably tens of thousands have by now. And it, it tells you, you know, 
the editor that bought it and the, the agent that sold it. And it's searchable by, you know, keywords. You could put in uh, 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 romance, uh, 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 Western, <laughs> whatever. Uh, and, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm always surprised that people don't use it more often because you can subscribe to it on just a monthly basis. Uh, I think it's like $25. Uh, you pick up a month and then you don't do it again the next month. Uh, but you can do a lot of research on who to send things exactly. to on that website. And it can save everybody a whole lot of time. Uh, yes? I wanted to ask about short story writers and collections of short stories. Number one, do you ever look at them? <coughs> If you are a writer of short stories, should you be looking for an agent who specializes in short fiction? Well, that's an interesting question. If you are a short story writer, should you be looking for an agent uh, who specializes in short fiction? And I don't even know if there are agents who do that. <coughs> yeah. So what do you what, what do you think, Emma? Well, uh, that's, that's an interesting question because I think um, I think if it's a really good short story writer, like say the say there was the, there was that recent um, cat person story, right, that went viral and everything, everyone knew it. Now it's a collection, and um, that sold because it was such a massive book. And then there are some short story writers that are just so good they keep winning award after award, and their stories stories get collected. Um, it's hard. I mean, the only the writers that I represent that are short story writers also write, you know, full length. So I don't know, I don't think we have anyone who just writes short fiction, but there probably are. But I think you just go to the agents that you think are the right for your project. Yeah, the right, the kind of fiction that your so. stories t tend to be. I'd also say in terms of short story writing, the more you can publish, the better it is. The more of your short stories that are published in literary <coughs> journals, the better it is, because then you, you build up an audience, and then you have a collection, mm -hmm. and then that's easier to sell it. Good point. Uh, yes, lady back there. Hi, uh, I was wondering if when, if if ever, and why you would ever recommend to an unknown, unpublished author to self-publish. Uh, I'm sorry. So when and you're, you're wondering if an agent would recommend to a, a not yet published author that they self-publish? Yes, an unknown, someone who is not a celebrity, has no. Doesn't right. have a million followers on Twitter, Instagram. So other, rather than accepting the novel or whatever, the, the, the book, the manuscript, and saying, I will represent you, they say, I won't represent you, but I think you should self-publish. Would, well, would that ever? Well, probably not in their professional careers, because this is how they make a living, but what advice could they give to someone here, potentially, as what would a reason to be to self-publish and not? Okay. Well, do you ever give advice to someone who submitted a manuscript that you think is good but not good enough, and that maybe they should self-publish? I mean, I'm assuming that's what they would think or else they would represent it. Well, I'll give you an example. I have an author who um, sometimes ghost writes, and he recently ghost wrote something for an entrepreneur, a woman who had a fabulous story, but I didn't think I could sell it, so um, I suggested that he self-publish, uh, or that he tell her to self-publish, yeah. and they thought that was a good idea, and then they, um, Apparently, there's this there's this uh, woman out there, there's a company out in California called She Writes Press, mm -hmm. right. right? And they do a great job, apparently. So that's what I found out. So in that area, there's mm -hmm. She Writes Press. Um, I think it's a good idea to self-publish if you've been knocking on the doors and you haven't had success. It's one way to uh, build your audience and to build your skills. Uh, sometimes the self-published books then become, um, they, they uh, rise in popularity and they are then picked up by a publisher or by an agent. So I had, um, I have clients who published a book called The Sheep Over, which are photographs of their sheep. They are Vermont farmers. They self-published. There was a piece about them. I read the piece. I called them. And the book was auctioned and uh, hit the bestseller list. Um, so that's a good success story. It doesn't always happen that way. But a lot of the genre books that um, we were speaking about earlier, which were mass market, you know, in the supermarkets in the old days, uh, are now the self-published genre books on Amazon. Or, uh, and, and the most popular genre for self-publishing is romance. And a lot of romance writers are making pots of money 
by self-publishing because they don't have to give the publisher a bunch of money. They don't just live on royalties. They get, you know, most of the income from the sales of their books. So, uh, from romance writers, I think even a lot of the traditional publishers are suffering in that category because so many of those writers are choosing to self-publish. So it's not something to be overlooked. It is a lot of work, because you have to do everything. But it is also an opportunity that didn't used to exist very much. It used to be called vanity publishing. And it isn't anymore. I mean, and it's now very accepted. And I think it's, um, if you're really having a lot of trouble getting representation, it is, in my view, really something to look into. So, um, yes, sir. Yeah, I'm curious uh, to hear from all of you. What is your assessment of ageism, the presence of ageism in the industry? But the question is, what is the assessment of the, of the agents of ageism in the publishing industry? In other words, do older people have more trouble getting published than younger people, right? spoken, uh, 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 and I wish we weren't there, but I think that it's, it's a fact of life. Uh, I, I certainly know that uh, uh, many, many, many of the editors that I'm uh, working with today uh, you know, were, you know, weren't even born when I started in this business. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they, this is an ageism, but they bring their own enthusiasm, their own uh, uh, sort of worldview to uh, to the table, and uh, you know they just may not connect uh, with uh, some of the things that I bring them uh, uh, by you know, cronies of mine. Uh, you know, so. Yeah, that, that's a very good point, Brenda. Do you want to say something? I th I think it's mostly been said. Um, I will say my oldest client is 91, and my youngest client is 25, which is kind of old, really. Because there are a lot of there are a lot of writers for teens who are eighteen and nineteen. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, because it's a teen market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you have, I, I apologize. That's okay. I'm, I'm sorry to miss. It. Yes. It's, yes. It's, right here. Um, so I have a question, and I guess I'm mostly interested in Brenda's response because I write in young adult fiction. But are there, I guess, for many of you, like any conferences or New York events that you feel like mm -hmm. aspiring writers should really be at, like? You hear about pictures and like all that kind of stuff. So the question is, are there any uh, particular events that writers, especially for young adults, uh, might want to attend that I guess are accessible from New York? Uh, for kids' books, there's the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, the SCBWI, which is a nationwide group of uh, authors who are both established and aspiring and perspiring. And uh, there, and uh, that I would recommend that. Uh, I would recommend getting on Twitter if you're a young adult author. There's, uh, you know, a lot of, and those of you who want a Twitter tutorial, we could do that offline. But there are a lot of, you know, hashtags that connect to YA, the YA lit, and as you mentioned, pitch wars. And for those of you who don't know, there are um, quarterly or even now monthly uh, so-called pitch wars. Uh, on Twitter, which is an online platform, 
and uh, they, uh, during the pitch war, you j as, an, as a new author, you just pitch in 40 characters. It's, you know, again, it's uh, uh, Harry Potter meets, um, you know, the, I don't know, Admiral, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, Knuffle Bunny meets, you know, um, where the wild things are. So, it's, so you, you um, pitch in 40 characters what your book is, and famously a book that's uh, now dominating the bestseller list called The Hate You Give was a pitch war find. Oh, so the author just yeah. said, I have a book about Black Lives Matter for teens. And uh, a savvy agent who was at the Bent Agency, Brooks Sherman, uh, picked that up and um, it has now sold probably probably a million copies in the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. And it's a movie and it's kind of a movement too. So, wow. so I do recommend getting, um, getting socially savvy, social, <coughs> social media savvy, especially for younger age books. Uh, yes, ma'am, the red sweater. Yes, uh, this is for Brenda. If you do the artwork as well as the uh, writing, how do you send that to the email? If you write a book that's, uh, that you've written and illustrated, how do you send it by email? You make a, a PDF, a, you know, you get it scanned, you go to a coffee shop, you ask them to scan it in a PDF, and they will do that, and they'll give you a little file, and then you submit it. Will we submit the whole book, or? Yeah, it depends on the agent. Some agent may say, I just would like two pictures. Some agent may say, what's your portfolio? <coughs> so you really have to look agent by agent. Um, yes, ma'am. Hi, so I have a question for Brenda as well about <laughs> children's um, picture books, because the industry, the, or the genre, I guess, has changed so much in terms of word count. And um, I have a book coming out, my first book actually with Simon & Schuster in September. Um, it's, it's a narrative nonfiction book uh, for adults and it's, a, it's, it's uh, ma mainly about education and parenting. And I kind of want to pivot and do a children's book series. So my question is, I understand that the word count has diminished significantly and that's very challenging for someone who's quite wordy. So I'm wondering how, if you, if you have anecdotes about pushing the envelope pushing to 1,000 words versus the 500, how receptive are publishers to that? Are they really, because when I read books to my kids now, I do notice, I have a, I have a six year, seven year gap between my oldest and my youngest, and I do notice the books, the words are getting significantly fewer, I guess fewer. is the best way. Mm -hmm. Did, did so. you all hear that? No. Uh, the question is, what about word count, I think, as I understand the question, and is it now um, easier to sell something that's shorter <laughs> and longer, more or less, right? And, and how can do you, you evaluate push that? The how does that figure into your decision making? Uh, picture books are much shorter than they used to be, for sure. Um, anything over 1,500 words, you're dead in the water. Uh, and unless, you know, the exception, but uh, generally. And, um, uh, but if each of your 1,500 words is perfect and cannot be done without, then go ahead. Just make sure that what you're writing is for the kid and not for the adult, mm -hmm. I would say. Good point. Uh, yes, ma'am. How do I learn, who, how do I get the names of these wonderful new young agents mm -hmm. yeah. making customers? <laughs> you know that's how a good, good question. How do I know interests or inclinations are? John, well, John, John had, had uh, you know, the answer. Do you want to just repeat, John, what you said before? Well, again, I think, Please uh, speak into your mic. I have trouble uh, hearing you, sir. Is this better? Yeah, oh, good. Oh. <laughs> uh, I have recommended a, a service called Publishers Marketplace, uh, which is, uh, you know, like, like Publishers Weekly, which is also a great resource. The Publishers Marketplace has a, uh, a directory of uh, sales that agents have made to publishers, and it's searchable. And you can put in search terms into that uh, that match what you're interested in, and it will it will turn up a list of the agents who have made sales uh, with a little description of each book um, that have made sales that uh, fit those terms. And it's really very helpful, I think, for aspiring writers. I find it helpful. I use it all the time uh, when I'm <coughs> sort of stymied for uh, uh, ideas about who to send a book out to that, uh, you know, I've gone through my, my usual uh, 
uh, suspects, and uh, I'm, I'm looking for somebody else who might be interested in it, and uh, I identify some uh, editors that way, and very often these young editors who I, I, I haven't known for 30 years. Uh, so it, it works for, for authors and agents too. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing, Publishers Marketplace. Um, we have about five or six more minutes, so um, I think we can take three more questions. Yes, the lady back there. Thank you. So I heard that nonfiction is the new maybe. So I'm interested in, I write for children, for nonfiction middle graders, and how is that market there? I know there are schools, I believe folks go to a lot of schools and libraries, and what about the trade books? I'm sorry, I didn't quite. Uh, the, the question is, how popular is nonfiction? How, how popular is nonfiction for, for kids? For kids. kids? Oh, okay. Very. Uh, and uh, picture book biographies are particularly interesting right now. Uh, but I, I know that there are a few more questions, and I know you had a question before, so I'm happy to answer more offline. Yes. And this, yes. Yeah, I'm wondering from a writer's point of view, especially a young writer who might not know anything about the publishing industry or about agents, how can someone tell the difference between a good agent and a bad agent? <laughs> <laughs> you don't know if you're a great, great person, question. That is, if you're an artist great and you question. don't want to push bounds, how do you right. tell? I think one of the things you do, because um, <laughs> it's a little tricky for an agent to answer that, is you look at what the agent has published. Yeah. You know, you see what their list is, you see what you think of that list, and um, that's a, book, a good way to start. Do, do you guys okay. want to add I, anything? I want to add one thing, which is that we have something called the AAR, the Association of Authors Representatives, and we have bylines and guidelines, we have, you know, a code of ethics, we, we all are members, those of us who, you know, you know, we just, we're members of that, and, and there are agents out there that are, you know, that do things that we can't do legally. We can't, you know, charge you to read a manuscript. If you get somebody saying, oh, I'll read your manuscript, but first send me $35, like, not a good agent, you know, or, you know, they just, just go to the AAR. It's a good website, too. And one other thing is go into a bookstore and look at the books you like and see what agents are acknowledged because you can learn so much that way, because almost everybody, especially with fiction, acknowledges their agent, actually with nonfiction too. Mm -hmm. think of it. So that's a good way to see who represents the kind of books that you want to write. Okay, and so more. you could be in the great position of being um, in a competitive, uh, you could be in a competitive situation with agents. So you query and four or eight agents all say, I love your, book and I want to represent you. Um, I don't love it when the when the potential client says, can I call some of your clients and ask them, it's kind of an intrusion, yeah. but I do ask the clients. Some, some of them are like, yeah, you can always call me. So you can also do that. You can call the agent's other clients and if, if the agent, if, if, you know, if it's all kosher and all that, but you can do that and um, they you can see what they say about their own agent. Mm -hmm. And this is maybe just a little too obvious, but I'd suggest having a, a nice, long, friendly conversation with anybody that you're considering. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's a very, very personal relationship. Yeah. And it's, you know, it could be the greatest agent in the world, and if you two don't click, it's probably not a good idea for you. So that's a, a very, a great point. Okay, two more questions. Um, Yes, ma'am. Um, we talked about it being uh, helpful to get an agent to have published. Are there, uh, do online magazines carry as much weight as print magazines, and are there ones that you think carry the most weight? So are online magazines as impressive as print magazines for agents considering your work? And then the second part of the question is, are there any magazines, I guess, either online or print that you think are particularly um, impressive? For nonfiction. Oh, for, I'm sorry, for, for non for nonfiction. Fiction. For nonfiction. I don't really read any online. John, do you? I don't read a great many online magazines. <coughs> these publications, I'll go and check out 
those pieces in those publications? And if the publication is something I've heard of or, 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 or I'm, I'm happy to be introduced to, uh, you know, that carries weight with me. Uh, uh, but obviously, you know, I'm sure for everybody, uh, the, more, the more familiar you are with, uh, with the magazine or whatever, you know, the more weight it will carry. Okay, last question, ladies and gentlemen. Is there anybody who has asked a question before who really is a question? I'm just wondering if anyone has flirted with graphic novels. Oh, good. Well, I bet I slept with graphic novels. <laughs> <laughs> just, just keep that in this room. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, if I may, um, I have, uh, when I was a publisher, I uh, uh, was most interested in graphic novels. I worked at Hyperion Disney, and they were very interested in that form and wanted to do a more upscale form. So I went to the Center for Cartoon Studies up in Vermont, and I, uh, when they were first starting, uh, met with a lot of their people and published quite a few graphic novels as a result. I helped Mark Siegel, who runs a imprint called First Second, do his first graphic novel at Simon & Schuster. So I'm I am I'm not as um, intimate as I once was with them, but I am always happy to see books in that form. So if you're doing a graphic novel, great. And there's a big call for them, uh, and they explore issues in ways that other books cannot. And they are they often catch the eye of um, of movie people because it's like oh the movie's all storyboarded. <laughs> I don't have to read anything. Um, so, um, forgive me, you're my uh, so, so they are often translated into film. Well, thank you, everybody. This has been a really fun night. I hope you can